Hi everyone, I'm Laurel Patterson. I'm a registered psychologist working in Vancouver, BC, and I'm very happy to be here. This is my first presentation uh, for the society, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your feedback on these ideas that are really helpful in my clinical work with individuals and couples where I specialize in sex and couple therapy. So certainly uh, people can have sexual difficulties without any problems with their health, with their, um, with their physical health, but with physical illness and disease it's even more common and these problems can impact both the patients and their partners. So that is why um, it can be really helpful to try to get out ahead of some of these issues if they haven't already become issues in your relationship and if they have to talk about some strategies for reconnecting sexually. So if you have any questions along the way, uh, please feel free to enter them in um, in your chat box and I'd be happy to try to answer them. Um, if there are bigger questions, you can definitely write those in as we go as well and perhaps we'll get to them more at the end. Um, but just to start, I'd love to know a little bit about you guys and how long you have been care partners. So if anyone wants to write that in, that would be very welcome. Just talking about something that might be somewhat obvious to some of you, uh, but perhaps, perhaps not something we talk about enough in our society, that sex is really important and an important aspect of our quality of life for the majority of people. Now there are some people for whom sex is not important, and that's fine too, but if it is important to either you or your partner or both of you, having sexual satisfaction can really positively impact your relationship satisfaction, can lead to better mood, offset some of the um, difficulties in life, help reduce stress and anxiety, and just generally make us feel happier in our life. So I'm seeing some um, comments from you guys in terms of how long you've been uh, care partners, this is really helpful. So it looks like a range of about uh, five to 12 years. And, and that's wonderful. And so, of course, your partners are probably in different stages given um, these different uh, timelines. And some of these issues may apply differently to some of you. So if you have any particular questions based on your situation, I'd be very happy to try to give some, some input on that. So there are a lot of things that affect sexuality in Parkinson's and of course there's the symptoms of the disease itself. So difficulties uh, with, with motor symptoms, um, difficulties with other aspects of functioning. There are side effects of medications and other treatments that might impact sexuality. There are general consequences of the disease, like fatigue, sleep disturbances, concentration problems. All of these things can impact sexuality and sexual functioning. There are also really important psychological difficulties. And in some ways, these might be the most important contributors to sexual problems in Parkinson's. So as many of you probably know, depression and anxiety are very, very common as well as changes in body image and self-esteem, which can impact our sexual self-esteem as well. And then role changes and adjusting to the disease and knowing that it's a chronic and progressive disease can be really difficult and impact sexuality. And then relationship problems as you as a couple try to figure out how to navigate this, this disease together. And sometimes there can be conflict because of that or, or a lack of uh, communication and that can certainly impact sexual interest and sexual connection. So in particular with Parkinson's, Parkinson's patients can experience difficulties with touching and hugging. Things that used to be really easy are no longer quite so smooth and fluid. And there can be difficulties with sexual positioning and activities. So because of the, the motor problems, um, it can be really difficult to do things sexually that he or she used to be able to do. 
because of the difficulties with communication that are part of the disease, there can be decreased opportunities for connection in a verbal way. And that can impact uh, sexual interest and also impact communication about sex during sexual activity. And as we, we talked about before, decreased body image and sexual uh, self-esteem. So not feeling attractive, not feeling like your body is in the shape that you once was or that it can do the same things it used to do. And then, of course, symptoms like drooling or difficulties with um, facial expressions can, can really play into that as well. Then, of course, bowel and bladder problems can be common and who wants to have sexual intimacy when you're feeling constipated or worried about incontinence or leakage? It's a pretty quick libido killer there. And then because of the symptoms of the disease itself or the medications, there can be problems with sexual functioning. So for male patients, the biggest one is problems with erections, either getting an erection or maintaining the erection at once once you've gotten it. And of course, erectile issues become more common with age as well. So add on to that um, the problems with, with the uh, Parkinson's symptoms or side effects of medications, and it can be really challenging. There can also be problems with low desire, and this is the top uh, difficulty that women with Parkinson's face. And uh, this may also lead to decreased uh, sexual arousal or vaginal lubrication in the case of women as well. Now, care partners also, unfortunately, have their share of sexual difficulties. And I'm curious if any of you can relate to any of these, either you know, as a chronic problem or just a transient problem. But the biggest one is really low sexual desire or arousal. And this can be because of fatigue or stress, and also because of a really significant role change that might lead to less attraction to your partner in a sexual way. And this is obviously not what anyone wants to experience, but kind of inevitable when you go from being equal partners in the relationship, um, seeing each other as separate and independent, to perhaps switching roles to being a caregiver and care receiver, which is basically just much less erotic and can impact uh, feelings of interest in in sharing sexual intimacy. There can also be, because of less desire and arousal, difficulty reaching orgasm, experiencing pain or discomfort during sexual intimacy because of lack of arousal, or perhaps worrying about uh, causing pain or discomfort to your partner. And of course, sadness or frustration at the loss of sexual connection or the familiar routine that you may have had for years or decades together. Um, and you know, one of the things that, that often happens in long-term relationships, regardless of medical problems, is that there is more familiarity and intimacy and coziness, and that is all great, um, but there might also be less novelty, excitement, and sort of insecurity like you might have had when you were dating, which are the things that can fuel sexual desire. And so um, given that you know all couples in long-term partnerships tend to experience some decrease in sexual frequency or sexual desire with adding on a, an illness like this, it can be even more challenging. So we know that with sexual difficulties, generally sexual frequency or the opportunities or um, or encounters that you have for sexual connection tend to decrease. And both partners can end up feeling rejected and not wanting to try to initiate sexual activity with the other for fear that the other isn't into it or that the other will turn them down. There can also be uh, more of a likelihood of, of sleeping in separate beds. And with Parkinson's, and I'm not sure if you guys have experienced this with your partners, but there can be a lot of sleep disturbances that happen. And so it can make more sense logistically, so both people can try to get some rest to try to sleep separately. But this can also be something that you might feel more comfortable with or prefer if you are having sexual difficulties. So it's not kind of in your face that every time you go to bed together, you're not having any kind of sexual intimacy. And outside of the bedroom, 
with sexual difficulties, there tends to be a reduction in general intimacy and affection, so um, hugging, kissing, that sort of thing, when you're feeling frustrated about sexual difficulties. So just to sort of summarize the different types of sexual problems that men and women can experience, whether they are patients or care partners. So for women, the biggest ones are low sexual desire and or low sexual arousal. So by arousal, we mean excitement mentally about sexual activity and then also the physical response of um, blood flow to the genitals, vaginal lubrication, all of that stuff. Difficulties reaching orgasm, pain with intercourse, and I put in parentheses just the, the technical terms for these difficulties. In men, the biggest ones, like I mentioned, are difficulties obtaining or maintaining an erection, low sexual desire. All this can lead to difficulty reaching orgasm, and then some men with Parkinson's also experience early ejaculation. So for, for um for them, they may have had no difficulties controlling when they ejaculated before, but with the disease and the medications and all that, um, that's changing and not feeling control over when they ejaculate. So there are some medical treatments for problems with sexual functioning, whether they are problems people are experiencing without any medical issues or because of medical issues. So for women, the biggest uh, Thing you can do to help with low arousal and, and low vaginal lubrication is of course adding lubricant and there are some really good uh, gentle hypoallergenic options nowadays like slippery stuff which is one that I recommend in my practice a lot it's got a nice uh, thicker texture it's really gentle you can pick it up at London Drugs if you have one in your area or order it online it's pretty widely available and then of course if there's um, vaginal dryness, and this can happen with age um, anyway from vulvovaginal atrophy. Estrogen cream can be really helpful and just acts locally um, at, on the vaginal tissues rather than being absorbed into the whole body. If there is genital pain, oftentimes there are tight muscles surrounding the vaginal opening for women. And so a specific kind of physiotherapy called pelvic floor physiotherapy can be incredibly helpful for learning to relax those muscles. Um, and one of the things that I, that I uh, didn't mention earlier when we were talking about depression was that although it can be really helpful to use an antidepressant medication if there is depression, these can also cause sexual side effects. And that is something that's not often discussed um, at the doctor's office, unfortunately. Doctors don't always ask about this, even though it would be great if they did. Um, but SSRIs like Prozac, Paxil, Celexa, those types of things are um, often associated with sexual side effects, especially delaying orgasm in women. Mm -hmm. um, and then in men and women, low desire and low arousal. And it can be helpful to switch to a different kind of antidepressant, like Wellbutrin, that's not an SSRI, or just add that and see if that helps with the sexual side effects. So for men, of course, when there's erectile dysfunction, drugs like Viagra can be really helpful to offset that. And same issue with any um, side effects related to antidepressant medication, that you can switch to a different antidepressant or add an antidepressant that doesn't have so many sexual side effects. In terms of psychological treatments, um, so a lot of people with sexual difficulties will seek out individual or couple therapy, which has been found to be quite effective. And the primary form of therapy is called cognitive behavior therapy. So the cognitive refers to thinking patterns and the behavior, as you can imagine, refers to behaviors. Um, and it can be really helpful to engage in this kind of therapy to change behaviors, especially around avoidance. So couples who've gotten into a pattern of avoiding sexual intimacy to um, get back into some kind of intimate connection gradually can be really helpful to develop some routines that help support having intimacy over the long term. In uh, this kind of therapy, we often assign touching exercises that help our couples reconnect 
in a sensual way without there being the pressure for sexual activity. Um, and it can be really helpful to identify and challenge unhelpful thought patterns as well. So sometimes we think really catastrophically about things. Um, we think like, oh, it's all, it's all over now, our sex life has gone to the toilet and there's nothing we can do. And that might not be true, that might just be the thoughts that we're having. And of course, communicating sexual needs, which is something I'll talk more about later, can be really, really helpful as well. Um, and thinking a little bit outside the box in terms of sexual difficulties, something that can be really helpful because we know that stress has a huge impact on sexual interest is actually just focusing on stress management and getting the indirect benefits from that on your sex life. So some of the things that can be really helpful are establishing a routine of self-care. So making sure to prioritize getting enough sleep, exercise, eating regularly and eating well, getting time for yourself to pursue hobbies or do things independently, getting time to rest throughout the day, seeking out social support, and then doing things that might be relaxing and then also perhaps help with accepting the things that you can't change. So like mindfulness meditation was just something that um, I personally have quite a bit of experience with in incorporating into therapy. So run um, group therapy where we, we teach people mindfulness for sexual difficulties and it's, it's really, really helpful. And then yoga is of course a form of mindful movement and can be helpful for connecting with your body, with your sensations, and cultivating an attitude of acceptance and non-judgment. So in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about six specific strategies to stay connected sexually. And like I mentioned before, you guys may be at different um, times in your, in your relationship. You may have been together for very different amounts of time with your partner. And you may have been um, coping with Parkinson's for different amounts of time as well. So these tips are actually really helpful regardless of where you're at. And it would be, I think, wonderful, but maybe put me out of a job um, if, in terms of a sex therapist, if everyone thought about these things at the beginning of their relationship, as soon as they moved in together, which is when a lot of couples do experience a decrease in sexual frequency because of what I was talking about before with the increased familiarity um, and intimacy, there can be a decrease in sexual excitement and mystery and all of that. So these strategies are, oh, we're having some problems with the numbers here, but that's okay. Uh, I'm supposed to say one to six. Um, anyway, so these strategies are to first maintain your own desire, and I'll talk about these uh, individually as we go, um, to try to express appreciation of your partner, to schedule date nights, to schedule intimate and touching time, communicate about your sexual desires and feelings, and to take care of your own sexual needs. So like I said, I'll talk about each of these in turn, and again, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to write them either in your chat box or in the Ask Me a Question section underneath. So first off, this idea of maintaining your own sexual desire basically comes from what we've found, which is that by turning ourselves on, that can be the first step to wanting to connect sexually with a partner. And we often overlook this and we hope that our partner will just turn us on already. And that might be easier, uh, but it's not necessarily realistic. So the idea is to ask yourself, what makes you feel alive and connected to your body? And are you doing those things? And if you're not, or if, or if you're not uh, doing them as often as you think might be helpful, then what can you do to incorporate more of these activities into your life? So some examples are exercising, spending time in nature, doing yoga, uh, doing th new things, interacting with other people, getting kind of the energy of, of uh, new people or new activities, reading or watching erotica, engaging in self-stimulation or masturbation. That can certainly keep you connected with your body and your identity as a sexual being. Um, taking long baths and showers, you know, doing, um, doing some of these things that might lead to pleasurable bodily sensations, getting a massage. 
So these things are things that you can do on your own. And then also, and then also things that you can do uh, with a partner. So perhaps encouraging uh, your partner to also do things that makes him or her feel alive and connected to his or her body. So as in this little picture here, perhaps going for a little some time in the in nature together. The second idea here is to try to express appreciation of your partner. And this can be really hard when you're dealing with something difficult. And oftentimes we focus our conversations on things that aren't working well or things that we need to negotiate or navigate together. And we don't always do this. And of course, this is a good idea for both of you to do for each other. But because we can't control another person's act uh, actions or behavior, um, this is just focused on what you can do yourself. The nice thing, though, is that when one partner starts to express more appreciation, it tends to model it for the other, and then the other often follows suit. So focusing appreciation, or sorry, expressing appreciation on your partner can really help focus your attention on what you love and still desire about your partner. So some things may have changed, of course, uh, but some things may be the same. You may still really love the feeling of your partner's warm body, the the way that you feel when you look into each other's eyes, all that kind of stuff. And this expressing of appreciation and attraction can help to counteract your partner's changes in body image and feelings of reduced desirability as well. And one of the nice things about desire is that we tend to play off of each other in a relationship. So oftentimes we feel more sexual desire ourselves when we feel like our partner is desiring us. And that works, uh, like I said, both ways. And so by starting the ball rolling, by expressing um, some appreciation and attraction and perhaps even desire when you do feel it towards your partner, that can help your partner feel more desired and more desire themselves as well. Um, the other idea is to schedule date nights. And this is probably the first thing I recommend in couple therapy. Um, for pretty much everyone because oftentimes life is busy and it's just not happening as much or we're focusing more on coziness and hanging out on the couch rather than doing uh, specific things like date nights. So the idea is to try to get back some of that novelty and excitement that you might have had earlier in your relationship. So the idea is to, um, of course, you don't have to dress to the nines, but uh, in dressing up a bit, like, you know, getting out of the sweatpants um, that we all like to hang out in. Um, if it's possible, going out. If not, of course, you can have a date night at home. Uh, trying something new, so whether it's just new food or listening to different music or going to see a new movie or a new restaurant. Um, at home, options are, you know, really you can play music and listen to music together perhaps um, over dinner or after dinner. If it's not possible to communicate as much verbally, it can be nice to, you know, share something that's not watching TV or a movie necessarily, but like listening to a podcast or a book on tape together. So you're sharing an experience where you can still interact and you're not both um, stuck staring at the TV, basically. And then the idea of eating at the table, which is something that a lot of couples stop doing. They might... Uh, eat separately or eat in front of the TV, which is, of course, totally fine uh, if that's what happens on your regular days, but trying to do something special and trying to add a little bit of romance into your life. The other idea is to try to schedule intimate or touching time. And we can often think like, well, intimacy shouldn't really be scheduled, should it? Isn't that kind of forced? Um, but there aren't a lot of things in life that we actually accomplish on a regular basis without scheduling them. And this sense that you know, sex or intimacy should be spontaneous often comes from how it felt spontaneous maybe when we were early in a relationship or dating. Um, but we know that if we actually think about it, sex was usually not very spontaneous then. If you were going out on a date, if you were uh, planning to get together, you might have uh, 
done a lot of things in preparation. You might have been thinking about how you'd probably be having sex later. You might have worn fancy underwear or, you know, done your, done your uh, hair or makeup differently. You might have put on a special outfit. And that whole day, you may have been essentially building up desire for the moment when you would be able to rip each other's clothes off. So not necessarily as spontaneous as we might think about it. And so the idea with um, scheduling intimate or touching time is that for this particular exercise, you're actually specifically communicating with your partner that there's no expectation of sex. And this can help really reduce the pressure that we can feel around the sense of like, okay, we've scheduled sex, we need to do sex even if one or both of us isn't really in the mood. But it's still an opportunity to connect with your bodies. So the idea with scheduling as well is not waiting for spontaneous desire to hit you like a lightning bolt because that doesn't happen very often in long-term relationships. Um, committed sex tends to be pretty premeditated and there's nothing really wrong with that if we can sort of wrap our heads around it. The other thing to think about when scheduling intimate or touching time is to choose a good time of day. So time when neither of you is too tired, when you have privacy, when your partner has fewer symptoms perhaps, so when symptoms are better managed. And this can be really helpful for setting yourselves up for a more positive uh, and less frustrating experience together. And then taking some time to set the mood for relaxation and romance. So you might take a shower or bath, um, you might play music, you might light candles, all that stuff that uh, we might feel sometimes isn't necessary or is kind of cheesy, but we know it actually really can work to help um, really get us in the mindset of uh, connecting sexually. The other thing that, that can be really important when dealing with a chronic illness is to try to have the bedroom, at least for the time when you scheduled this intimate time, be free of medical paraphernalia um, and free of things that might kind of remind you of your caregiver and patient roles. And so trying to tidy up the bedroom basically and set some mood lighting and, and get in the, that mindset. Um, but what do you do when you've scheduled this intimate time and maybe you're not feeling like having sexual, uh, sexual activity together or one, of, or one or both of you isn't? Um, so you have different options, of course. You can lie together and cuddle. You can give each other a massage. And this doesn't have to be a you know, really intense, like Swedish massage, like you would get at the at the uh, from a massage therapist. This can just basically be gentle stroking. Um, you can take a nap together and spoon, um, and you can engage in sexual activity if you'd like to. And there are a few things that are important for helping us feel motivated in terms of engaging in sex. So the one, one of those is trying to expand your definition of sex. So a lot of couples, especially heterosexual couples, um, tend to see sex as culminating in vaginal intercourse and that sex kind of is vaginal intercourse and that the other stuff that you do is foreplay and kind of just leading up to the main event. And the issue with that is that, you know, with age in general, and especially with illness, it can be difficult to have intercourse. And it can be disappointing if you're thinking that the only thing that qualifies as sex is intercourse and you're not able to have it. So really trying to expand your definition of what sex is to include all sorts of touching and pleasuring. Um, so whether it's touching of erogenous zones on the body, um, kissing, making out, oral sex, uh, using sex toys, like vibrators, you know, all these things can be really, really helpful to produce some sexual arousal in the body, to share pleasure. And when you're thinking about what to do sexually, something to consider too is what can you still do? So as, a, as patients and as caregivers, so 
Um, perhaps there are some sexual difficulties that make penetration difficult, but then there are, it's difficult either because of lack of arousal or because of um, pain or something like that, but what can you still do together? Your hands are probably uh, still working. Uh, your partner may have some difficulties with motor uh, movements, of course, um, but that's when you can add perhaps sex toys or things like that to uh, make up for any decrease in fine motor skills. Um, and really just focusing on perhaps the things that you used to do when you were new to sex. So lying on top of each other, rubbing yourselves against each other, kind of focusing on full body uh, contact can be really helpful too. And trying to treat, you know, your, your different uh, sexual repertoire or the things that you're trying is a bit of an experiment and something that can be perhaps kind of funny or um, a, nice, a nice way to to connect with each other regardless of whether it leads to you know orgasm for both people and tons of tons of physical pleasure and all of that so i want to talk a little bit about how sexual response tends to work in long-term relationships um, and come back to that idea that i just brought up um, a moment ago about how sex in long-term relationships tends to not be spontaneous if it's actually going to happen. So I'm going to show you a model of what we know about how sexual response works in long-term relationships and I'll walk you through it because it looks kind of complicated. Um, and in fact it's, it sort of is because instead of it being linear, right, like we feel desire and then we engage in sex and then it's all uh, pleasurable and orgasms and satisfying and then we're done, um, it's more circular. So this model was developed by a sex researcher and clinician who works at the BC Center for Sexual Medicine at UBC. And it's been found to be really, really useful as a way of explaining how sexual response works. So if we start right here with the first box, the idea is that instead of necessarily feeling sexual desire at the beginning of a sexual encounter, we can start out with having one or more reasons for sexual activity. And these reasons can be more like decisions or um, things that you think you'll get out of sex, perhaps, if you engage in it. And these decisions can be based on like wanting to experience emotional connection with your partner, wanting to experience physical pleasure, that sort of thing. And perhaps remembering that other times when you have tried to engage in sex, this has happened. Um, so at this point, you're, you're feeling sexually neutral, perhaps. You're perhaps not feeling any kind of uh, sexual desire or horniness or burning in your loins or anything like that. Um, and then, of course, if you have some good reasons for engaging in sex, you can be willing to seek out sexual experiences either with your partner on your own in terms of masturbation or be receptive to a partner trying to initiate sexual uh, touching with you. And if you are willing or receptive, you then move on to engage in some sexual stimulation. And we call it stimuli instead of just stimulation to emphasize that the things that can turn us on are not necessarily just touch. So we can also really get turned on by things that are visual, so seeing our partner. Um, we can get turned on by smells, so whether it's a partner's perfume or cologne or soap or a partner's body smells, um, all of that can be really arousing. Or it could be things like uh, the things you're hearing. So perhaps you find it arousing when your partner um, moans or when your partner whispers sweet nothings or talks dirty, that kind of thing. So stimuli can really uh, encompass a wide variety of, of things that you can incorporate into your sexual encounters. Um, and you'll notice here it also says that you need to have an appropriate context. And this is something that we often overlook and that uh, I was mentioning a little bit about before when we were talking about um, 
setting aside some time where you have privacy and that sort of thing. So the context can mean the space around you. So do you feel like your room is tidy and not distracting because of piles of laundry in the corner? Um, do you feel like you have enough privacy? Do you feel like you're feeling warmly towards your partner? That the context between the two of you is good? And all of that. Um, and sometimes, you know, we think that we shouldn't have to set up a context, that it should just be that we fall into bed together and everything's fine. But really, um, Paying some attention to context can be quite pivotal at increasing desire if desire has decreased. And even things like how recently you've each showered or brushed your teeth or things like that can factor into context. Because if you're not aroused yet, there can be a lot of things that will derail a sexual encounter that might uh, turn you off. Whereas if you're already aroused, you can tolerate all sorts of stuff um, that you might not, that, that might not bother you. So you'll see down in this box here, although, you know, usually good sexual stimuli in an appropriate context will um, lead to some, some arousal, there are a lot of factors that can influence how we process sexual stimulation. And some of these factors are biological or physical, and those can include things like how tired we are, if we have a headache or pain elsewhere in our body, um, if we're experiencing side effects of medications or symptoms of, of an illness or, or disease. Um, and then in terms of psychological factors that can impact, of course, our stress levels and how distracted we are by other things going on in our life can really influence how well we're tuning into sexual stimuli. And Sometimes, um, in terms of psychological factors, we can also get a bit, uh, a bit tripped up by, you know, things like old resentments towards our partner, or perhaps um, arguments we've had that aren't totally resolved, and it's all fine until we get into bed, and then we're like, you know, not really feeling very warmly towards you right now, mm -hmm. and so that can be distracting too. So let's say everything is going well, though. We've got some good reasons to engage in sex. We're willing and receptive and we're engaging in some sexual stimuli that feels good. There's a good context. We're not uh, too bothered by biological or psychological distractions. And we start to experience some sexual arousal. And sexual arousal, like I mentioned, can be mental. It can be about um, feeling excited and woken up sexually. It can also be physical. So there can be increased blood flow to the genitals. You can feel tingling and warmth and all sorts of good stuff for women. Um, you can experience vaginal lubrication and for men, erection. And so when we start to feel this arousal, sometimes it's only at that point that we're realizing we're feeling aroused that we can start to feel desire that's more sexual in nature that's actually triggered by the awareness that we're feeling aroused. So this is a pretty cool phenomenon um, that really runs counter to what we might have learned initially about sex, that desire comes first. And we know that desire can actually come after we start to feel aroused. So there are ways of eliciting arousal intentionally when you've decided that you'd like to try to have sex, um, which we can talk about in a moment, uh, that might be really helpful for triggering some desire. So if everything so far in this cycle has been going well, um, we will feel emotional and physical satisfaction at the end of the encounter. And whether we decide or interpret a sexual encounter as satisfying usually depends on whether we feel like we've met our original goal or original reason for engaging in sexual activity. So if our reason was to feel connected to our partner and we've had a nice time rolling around and maybe we've shared some eye contact and uh, we're, feeling, we're feeling connected, we'll be like, yeah, that was great. And that will then have a positive influence on our motivation the next time that we'll remember, oh yeah, like I didn't really necessarily know if I had, I had the energy to get into sex, but then we did and it was nice and maybe I'll try that again. Um, so the essential piece here with this model is that in the very middle, you can see that there's this 
spontaneous sexual uh, hunger or drive. And that can come up from time to time, right? You might just like wake up from a sexy dream at some point and, <laughs> and feel, uh, feel desire. And that can provide an original reason for having sex. It can certainly impact willingness and help us tune into sexual stimulation and all of that and kind of jumpstart things. But it's actually not crucial. And you can have a totally positive and wonderful sexual encounter without ever feeling any kind of spontaneous desire. So I'm curious if any of you guys have any reactions to this, if you've heard about this idea before, if this seems to make sense based on what you've noticed. Please feel free to write any, any comments if you have any. Um, oftentimes people find that this model helps to explain what they experience, that in a long-term relationship they might not have much of this this spontaneous desire um, and they may miss it and that's certainly valid because it feels good to just be up for sex um, but that it's not necessarily tragic to not have it or even not normal. Most people in long-term relationships don't have a ton of instances of spontaneous desire. Um, so the other idea Number five on our list of things uh, that we can that we can do to help connect, stay connected sexually, is to communicate about sexual desires. So we can communicate non-verbally, of course, and this can be done during sexual encounters. We can take our partner's hand and move it, or or uh, apply more pressure or less pressure with it. We can make noise when we like things, so even if you um, feel a little bit shy about saying things specifically like do this, do that, um, certainly our partner can get it if we are moaning or expressing some uh, pleasure in a nonverbal way. We can also show our partner what we like, so um, for a lot of people they may know what they'd like their partner to do but have a hard time explaining it so you could kind of do it to yourself um, let's say as an example if you're showing your partner how you like your clitoral area stimulated or something like that um, you can show your partner and that can be really really useful um, we can also communicate verbally about sexual desires and this is something that's often great to do uh, outside of the bedroom so choosing a time to talk about uh, what your sexual relationship has been like lately and what you'd like it to look like. Uh, reflecting on what you want first so you're going in not, you know, like, ah, I'm just so unsatisfied, but you actually have some ideas about what you guys could do together to improve things. Um, accentuating the positives. Try to speak in I terms, it's always a good idea, of course. Um, and trying to make requests rather than demands. Um, of course, those ones go over better. Mm -hmm. And trying to also elicit what your partner wants. So given that you guys may have some limitations on sexual activity, what does your partner want? Uh, and how can you two work together so you both share some pleasure? Another idea related to communication, this is part two of the communicating, um, is communicating about your feelings about sex. So this isn't so much about what you want sex to look like, but more about how you're feeling about it. And so it can be really important to do this with your partner and to really, if things have gotten more difficult, to express and share in the sadness about the loss of your old sex life. That's okay to acknowledge it. And oftentimes through acknowledging the way things used to be and what you miss, you can feel a sense of connection and you can also let go of some of the things that you can't change a little bit more easily. And this also gives you an opportunity to reassure your partner of your commitment uh, to him or her and hopefully hear the same thing back, of course. And then it can be really important to also have someone to talk to about your sex life that's outside of your partnership. And this is because it's always good to be able to just express our frustration or resentment or all sorts of things um, to somebody who is outside of the relationship. And 
um, this can be a great opportunity to talk about some of the things that you think might hurt your partner's feelings, but that are important for you to acknowledge in your own experience. Um, it can also be an opportunity to seek empathy and social support. And so it's really great you guys have this community together of people who are experiencing similar things. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is the idea of taking care of your own sexual needs. And this might be more relevant um, when your partner's disease has progressed um, and perhaps sexual activity has become more limited and there may be opportunities for touching and intimacy but in terms of actual sexual stimulation maybe not so much. And when we don't take care of our own needs this can of course lead to resentment and frustration and um, sexual release or orgasm can be really important for regulating our mood actually. A lot of people um, use sex or masturbation for stress management and so these are all good things about kind of taking care of, of your own needs. So ways you can do that, of course, fantasize, it's always nice, um, reading or watching erotica, and engaging in masturbation can be really helpful too. And um, certainly something that a lot of people in long-term relationships continue to, to use to either supplement their um, sexual experiences together or to uh, make up for any decreased sexual connection with their partner, for sure. So the idea here is, let's say you've tried all these things, and some of them are working, some of them might not be, depending on your particular situation, and that's, of course, uh, totally understandable. But what other ideas might there be? So. Uh, Certainly trying to manage any medical or medication related contributors to sexual difficulties can be really, really important. And like I was saying before, unfortunately, doctors don't tend to ask enough about this. And I don't know what your experiences have been about this, um, but the vast majority of uh, people with Parkinson's, something around 87% has been found in research, experience some sexual difficulties. So that's certainly um, something the doctor should be asking about and should at least know about if you bring it up um, or if you encourage your partner to bring it up. And like I said, there are some medications that can be really helpful. There aren't a lot of medications, as you may have noticed from the slide, on uh, medical treatments for women's sexual difficulties other than things that help lubrication. But you may have heard of a medication approved in the U.S. called uh, Flavanzarin, or Addy, I think was the, the brand name, um, that was approved for low sexual desire. It hasn't been approved in Canada. It doesn't seem to be all that effective. Um, and you also can't drink when you take it, which is not the best for a lot of people who might want to have a glass of wine to relax and perhaps increase their desire a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, for women, there isn't a lot, but for men, there is certainly the option of Viagra and that kind of thing. Um, and although Viagra works on arousal, physical arousal rather than desire, oftentimes when men um, are able to get erections easier again, their desire increases. And their partner's desire might increase too, because it generally feels good when your partner has an erection and it can make you feel more uh, attractive and your partner's more into things, so that's all good too. Um, of course, you can seek out individual or couple therapy, and I know that uh, many of you are not in the Vancouver area, and so there's a website, well, it's actually kind of like an online magazine called Psychology Today that has um, a directory of therapist and you can select that you're looking for a sex therapist if that's uh, the concern and find someone in your area that way. And there are many of us who also offer uh, online or Skype sessions. Um, so that's certainly something that I do for people who are in small communities and are uh, wanting some help and don't have you know, someone specialized in their area. You can also work on stress management for yourself, um, help your uh, partner with stress management as well. 
you can seek out some uh, self-help books on sexuality, which often have a lot of really great exercises you can do. And then if you want to add some variety or interest into your sexual routine, you can also visit a sex toy store. And again, I'm more familiar with the ones in this area, um, and, but I know that many of them you can order from, so I actually have a list in a couple of slides. So in terms of self-help books, there are a lot of really good ones. Here are a few on female sexuality. So the first one, Becoming Orgasmic, is really great for increasing capacity for orgasm and also for connecting with your sexuality in general. And then there are some other books more on desire. For male sexuality, there are a couple of really great ones I use a lot in my practice on erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation. And they talk about medical contributors as well and about really adapting to your situation. Um, and so certainly not an overly uh, simplistic view of, of what might be causing those issues. And then a lot of really good books on couple sexuality as well. So um, Esther Perel, the first book there, Mating in Captivity, has uh, she's got a wonderful TED Talk that you can actually find online really easily, uh, all about desire and long-term relationships. And then there are a few other ones which are uh, more around desire. And then The Guide to Getting It On is a great, it's a huge book, it's really thick, uh, all about the different things you can do sexually together. It has little like illustrations and stuff that can be quite helpful and, and actually start conversations with your partner too, like, hey, we've never tried this, what can we do here? And then in terms of sex toy stores, so in Vancouver, there's The Art of Loving and there's Women's Wear, um, which are really great and certainly not uh, the cheesy sex toy store with like the edible underwear and that kind of thing um, that you might be thinking of. And they have really good products that are safe for your body. They've got great lubricants, vibrators, dildos, all sorts of good things. Um, and then I've also listed Come As You Are, which is a Toronto store, but has a great website that you can order all sorts of stuff off of. And these stores tend to be um, collectives and, and uh, owned by people who are really sex positive and they have really good information on their website too. The Come As You Are uh, website has, has great uh, instructions for how to use things and stuff like that as well. So I'm all done. The, uh, I guess formal part of the of the talk and wondering if you guys have any ideas or comments or questions uh, based on based on what I've talked about so far. So thank you so much for your